On the Klondike Trail by Richard P. Emanuel Chapter 1 Seattle gave way to the north The sound of the voice in the kitchen told Willy Wolf that his uncle Al was excited. I'll tell you, Carl, you never saw so much gold in all your life, Albert Wolf said in a loud voice. He was talking with his older brother Carl, Willy's father. And it wasn't just dust. The man had a bag of gold nuggets the size of peas. No bigger. I saw it myself. It was right next to him when he took out his gold and ordered drinks for everyone in the bar. Willie sneaked into the room just as his father filled the coffee cup on the table in front of Uncle Al. Slow down, Al, Willie's father said. Some of the men at the fire station were talking about the big gold strike up in Canada too. But it's hard to believe what people are saying. I thought so too, Al said, until I saw this guy's gold. It seemed to Willie that everyone in Seattle was talking about gold. A week ago, on July 17th, 1897, a ship had docked in Seattle with two tons of gold from the Klondike River, somewhere up north. Since then, people had been infected by a strange illness. Everyone called it gold fever. Uncle Al's eyes shone as he spoke. After a while, Willie saw that his father's eyes were shining too. I am going to the Klondike, Albert Wolf finally said. I'm going to get rich, Carl, and you must come with me. We'll get rich together. Willie did not breathe while he waited for his father's answer. Suddenly, Carl Wolf noticed his son. Willie, he said sharply, how long have you been listening? Not one word of this to your mother or sister, do you hear? This is just talk between Al and me. Now run outside and pull some weeds in the garden. The door slammed behind Willie as he ran down the steps and into the garden. He stopped at the row of tomatoes. They were heavy with fruit. Willie's thoughts were spinning when he dropped to his knees and began to attack the weeds. After a few minutes, the sound of men's voices stopped and the soft voice of Carl's mother sailed through the window. The back door slammed again as Uncle Al came out of the house. He stopped at the bottom of the steps to light his pipe, then walked along the path into the garden towards his nephew. Willie jumped to his feet. Uncle Al, he said excited, do you really think you'll find gold? Can't fail, Willie, his uncle said. The stuff is just lying on the ground up there. All you have to do is scoop it up. I only hope that your father comes along. Two can scoop up more gold than one. Uncle Al, three can scoop up more than two, Willie said. I want to go with you. I'll be 15 in a couple of weeks and I could be a big help. Will you talk with mother and father, please? Albert Wolf smiled at his nephew. It seemed as if he had been Willie's age just yesterday. Like his nephew, Al had been a boy full of dreams and ideas. Now 30, Albert Wolf was a dreamer still. He puffed on his pipe. When Willie walked into the kitchen with his arms full of tomatoes, he saw a scowl on his mother's face. Hannah Wolf was talking with her husband. Her voice was no longer soft. He's too young, Carl, she said. Anyway, I need him here. You and Al can run off after gold if you want to. I can stop you. But I'll need Willie to keep this door open. You know how busy it's been with this crazy gold fever. No, Carl. Willie must stay in Seattle with me. It had been three years since the wolves had moved to Seattle. Eight years before that, in 1886, Carl and Hannah Wolf had said goodbye to their home in Klausthal, Germany. Willie had been just four when the family had arrived in the United States and he could not remember anything about Germany. His sister Lily, who was a year older than Willie, could not remember much either, but his other sister, Theresa, who had been eight, remembered the difficult move quite clearly and often spoke of what the family had left behind. Life in the United States had been very hard at first. Carl Wolf learned English and worked at several jobs before he joined the railroad company. As the Great Northern Railroad was built westward, the family moved west with the company. When the railway reached Seattle on the Pacific Ocean, Carl took a job as a firefighter and life at least became a little more settled. Hannah was a very good seamstress and had always made clothes for the family. She made rugged work clothes for Carl from heavy cloth and strong thread. Soon other firefighters asked her to make clothes for them and Hannah began to sell clothes to make money for her family. In Seattle, Hannah opened a shop. She made and sold work clothes to firefighters, shipbuilders and railroad workers. More and more miners came to Seattle to buy equipment for their mines in the wild northwestern mountains and they too bought clothes from Hannah's company, which she called Wolfwear. By 1897, Wolfwear had a fine reputation. 
and Hedda made as much money from her special work clothes as Carl made as a firefighter. The gold fever hit Seattle. Willie Wolf stood outside a busy store and looked at the heavy bags of flour in the back of Uncle Al's wagon. He looked at the packets of bacon which were piled next to him. Are you sure you will need all this? he asked. How will you ever get it all to the gold fields? 400 pounds of bacon! It might be easier to buy a pig and take it to the Klondike River. Uncle Al laughed. If we took a pig, we need food for the pig, Willie. And yes, we'll need it all. If we don't have enough equipment and food to feed two men for a year, the mounted police wouldn't even let your father and me across the border into Canada. And Canada is where the gold is. Now help me load this onto the wagon. Then I want you to take it to my house. I have to buy some tools. I'll meet you in an hour back at the house. When the wagon was loaded, Uncle Al waved and disappeared into the crowd. Willie climbed into the wagon and picked up the reins. He shook the reins and the horse slowly began to pull the wagon towards home. Shouts filled the air as Willie passed the long streets which were piled on both sides with supplies for the Klondike. Signs seemed to shout to Miners, supplies, outfits for Alaska! Mountains had been made from bags of flour, sugar and beans. There were piles of tents and sleds, stove, camping and cooking equipment of every description. Men, women and children walked or hurried through the streets. Others stood outside businesses to watch and discuss the activity or to swap the latest stories from the north. At last Willie reached his uncle's home and began to unload the supplies. As he took things from the wagon he checked them off on the list which his uncle had given him. At the top of the list were the words outfit for two men. Under food the list included 800 pounds of flour, 400 pounds of bacon, 200 pounds of beans, 200 pounds of sugar, there was coffee, butter, baking supplies, 100 cans of condensed milk, dried apples and other fruit. Under camping equipment there were blankets and tents, laundry soap and pots for cooking. The list of clothes included wooden socks, shirts and trousers, boots and raincoats. On the page for tools and mining supplies Willie saw two words that made his heart jump. The words were written in large letters and underlined. Gold pans. Even with Willie's help, Carl and Al Wolf took two weeks to buy and pack their Klondike outfit. And every day ships crowded with passengers sailed from Seattle for Alaska. Finally, the Wolf brothers were ready to join the stampede to the north. The evening of August 8, 1897 was strangely quiet in the Wolf house. The family met for a last dinner before Carl and Al began their adventure. Hannah felt tired after working hard at her store. Thanks to the gold fever, she was selling work clothes as fast as she could make them. Still, Hannah had taken time to cook her husband's favorite meal. Roast pork and potatoes followed by apple pie. Willie ate little of his food. Lily sat next to her brother and tried to cheer him up. Across from Willie, Theresa talked and talked about everything but the one thing in everyone's thoughts. Carl and all's departure in the morning. When they were eating the pie, Uncle Al finally spoke. Tomorrow is a special day, he began. But perhaps you have all forgotten. It's Willie's birthday. He will be 15. Willie sat up in his chair. He had forgotten his own birthday. Uncle Al put a small present on the table in front of his nephew. Lily clapped and Willie opened the gift. It's a pocket knife, he shouted as he turned the birthday present over and over in his hands. It's German. It's very well made, Al explained. I got one just like it for me and one for your father too. We'll use them a lot when we are going and I guess you might need one too if you follow your own gold rush someday." He smiled at his nephew. Al didn't notice the scowl on Hannah's face, but Carl saw it. Willie saw it too, but he looked away. A soft rain fell in Seattle the following morning as Carl, Al and Willie Wolf drove their wagon towards the docks. They stopped on the dock next to the steamship Excelsior. The dock was crowded and so was the ship. It took almost an hour to load the Wolf's brothers outfit onto the Excelsior, which was getting ready to sail to Skagway, Alaska. There were several ways to the Klondike, but there was not enough time before Alaska winter set in to take the longest route. That was the all-water route, which meant 3000 miles sea journey to the mouth of the Yukon River, then 1500 miles up the Yukon to Dawson City, where the Klondike River joins the Yukon. 
the Wolf Brothers had decided to try a shorter route. They would sail north from Seattle to the town of Skagway. From there, two rails led through the mountains into Canada. The White Pass Trail led from Skagway through White Pass across rugged land to Lake Bennett. From there, a series of lakes and streams led to the Yukon River and down to Dawson City. The other trail began in Dai, three miles northwest of Skagway and ran through Chilkoot Pass to Lake Bennett and then on to the Klondike. Carl and Al had discussed the two routes with anyone who had an idea, but they agreed that they would not decide which trail to take until they reached Skagway and could study things for themselves. Willie helped his father and uncle settle on board the Excelsior. At 9 a.m. a loud whistle ordered everyone who was not a passenger to leave the ship. As he walked towards the gangway, Willie had a wild idea to hide on board the ship. Then his father gave him a hug. Uncle Al shook his hand and Willie joined the line of people walking down the gangway to a crowded dock below. At 9.30 the Excelsior threw off the last rope and left the dock with another great blast of its whistle. Willie thought he saw Uncle L wave goodbye as the ship moved away, but he could not see his father. It was 11 a.m. when Willie climbed onto the wagon and shook the reins. His knife was in his pocket. He put his hand in his pocket and felt it. Suddenly he remembered what day it was. Happy birthday, he said to himself. He looked into the gray sky. The rain felt cold on his face. Chapter 2 Willy Wolf's right hand slammed down hard on the kitchen table. His face was red and he shouted at his sister. Theresa, you should not talk about things you don't understand and you know nothing about gold. I know one thing, Theresa said with a smile. Dad and Uncle Al won't find any gold. There are too many crazy stampedos like them who are trying to get to the Klondike. Dad and Uncle Al should have stayed here and helped Mom, just as you are doing, William dear. Theresa's smile made Willy suddenly explode with anger. He turned around and ran out of the house. He had to get away, he needed to think. In the garden, Willie sat under a tree and pulled a letter from his pocket. Carl Wolf had written the letter to his son three weeks before while he was sailing north on board the Excelsior. Once again, Willie read his father's description of the ship crowded with St. Peter's. There were men from all over the world and some women and children too. Everyone was hungry for gold, excited and certain that he or she would soon be rich. But there was no one more excited or sure of his fortune than Willie's Uncle Al. In Seattle, Willie had been busy with his work since his father and uncle had left. He worked 16 hours a day at Wolfware and around the house and garden. But even while he worked, he could not think of anything else but the gold in the north. At night, Willie dreamed of the Klondike River. With a golden shovel in his hand, he stood under a midnight sun and filled sacks with nuggets of gold. But every morning, when he woke up, the dream slipped farther away. The great Klondike stampede was racing on without him. Willie put his father's letters back in the pocket and walked out of the garden. He did not think about where he was going, but he soon found himself on the docks. Two ships were unloading. One was the Excelsior. An officer stood at the bottom of the Excelsior's gangway. Willie walked over to him. Excuse me, are you going back to Skagway? Do you need any more workers? I'm a hard worker. The man looked at Willie. How old are you, son? He asked. Willie blushed. He paused. I'm... I'm 17. The man was silent for a moment. We only workers, he said. Half of the men that we hire jump ship in Skagway and don't sail back to Seattle. You wouldn't do that now, would you, son? What's your name? Willie Wolf, sir. No, sir. I just want to make some money. Well, we're leaving tomorrow morning and we can use a young man with some energy. Report to the galley. The cook's name is Ericsson. Tell him you're the new kitchen boy. It was long after midnight when Willie arrived back at his dark house. He lit a lamp in the kitchen and wrote a note to his mother. Then he wrote a longer letter to Lily. His mother would be angry, he knew, but Lily would understand. She had always been close to her brother. It would be hard at the store without me, Lily, and I'm really sorry about that, Willie wrote. But business at Wolfware will start to slow pretty soon. Any stampede who hasn't left Seattle by the end of August won't make it to the Klondike before winter. The problem is, Lily, if I wait until business slows, then I won't make it either. It was true that Willie did not have a Klondike outfit, he wrote, but he could travel more quickly without one. He would catch up with his father and uncle and they had extra supplies. He would help them get to the Klondike faster and he would help them dig more gold. 
really loved his mother and sister, even Theresa. But he was 15 now and he could not sit in Seattle and watch the stampede go by. When he finished his letter, Willie went to his room and put some things into a cloth bag. At 5 a.m. he left the house. There was fog in the streets, but the mist glowed with the first light of day. The light grew stronger as Willie walked block after block until somehow the glow began to slip into his heart. Willie began to whistle. He was on his way to the Klondike. Doug Erickson, the chief cook on the Excelsior, whistled and sang while he worked. He was good to Willie, but it was hot in the galley and dining room and the work was hard. There were so many stampeders to feed that the dining room filled with people five times for every meal. When breakfast was done, it was time to serve lunch and when lunch was finished, it was time to cook dinner. Erickson watched Willie and seemed to know when he needed a break. Willie, he would call, take some coffee to the captain. Bringing food and coffee to the wheelhouse was Willie's favorite job. He enjoyed getting away from the noise in the galley and as he climbed the steep stairs, the wind on his face was cool. The man in the wheelhouse did not say much to the young kitchen boy, but they let him look around and there was much to see. Dark green woods rose from the shore, sometimes close to the ship on both sides, sometimes far away across a shining silver sea. Above the green woods, mountaintops covered with snow touched the sky. Blue-white glaciers flowed from the mountains down to the sea. Twice, while Willie was in the wheelhouse, sailors shouted WHALE and pointed at the giant animals which were swimming near the ship. At the end of the day, when the last pot was clean and Willie was completely exhausted, Ericsson always took his young assistant to a small place behind the wheelhouse. It was never quiet aboard the Excelsior, where there were always some stampeders who were arguing and playing cards. But from the cook's secret place, the shouts were not so loud and the two friends could quietly talk as Alaska's awesome wilderness passed by. By the fifth day, the cook had heard Willie's plan and he was worried. It won't be easy to find your dad and uncle, he said. There are two routes to the Klondike from Skagway and you don't know which way they are going. You don't have an outfit and you can't get into Canada without supplies. And Skagway is dangerous, tell my boy. I wish you would sail back with us, but Willie was determined. After a short stop in Juneau, the next day the ship traffic grew as the Excelsior neared the northern end of its route. When Skagway finally appeared, activity exploded aboard and around the ship. Skagway was new and the town's one small dock was not large enough for the gold rush traffic. Most ships anchored as near to shore as possible, then small boats crowded around to carry passengers and supplies to the beach. Stampeders shouted and pushed one another in their excitement to get into the boats. Sometimes, with a shout and a splash, a box of a passenger dropped into the sea. William Erickson rowed to shore in a boat full of supplies for a restaurant in Skagway. The sailors who rowed the boat piled the supplies on the beach just out of reach of the water. Then they pushed the boat back into the sea, jumped in and rowed out for another load. Erickson hired a wagon to carry the boxes of food to the restaurant. As Willie and the cook rode along the busy dirt street, Willie thought about his friend's words of concern. There were hundreds of people, perhaps thousands, crowded into Skagway, and more were arriving every day. Willie saw piles of lumber and heard the noise of hammers everywhere. Wooden buildings were going up all along the street, but it was still a town of white tents. Even the restaurants where they delivered their load of supplies was in a tent with a wooden floor. What Willie saw was a town that was being born on the edge of a great wilderness. When a job was done, Willie and Erickson slowly walked back towards the beach. The older man put his hand on Willie's shoulder. Have you changed your mind? He asked softly. You won't get rich aboard Excelsior, my boy, but you are sure to make some money. Willie looked at his friend. He said nothing for a moment. Then he shook his head. No, he said. I've come all this way and I'm going to find my dad. He and Uncle Al can't be too far ahead of me. He tried to sound more certain than he felt. Erickson sighed and reached into his pocket. He pulled out $50 and handed it to Willie. You will need this, he said. It's your pay plus a little more from me. I'm not supposed to give it to you until we start to sail back. The captain thought you might want to jump ship. He was right, of course. But you've earned your money and it's wrong not to give it to you. Still, I won't last very long. 
When they reached the beach, Erickson asked Willie for his mother's address in Seattle. I'll visit her, he said. I'll tell her you are all right. And we meet again when you get home from the Klondike. You'll be rich, of course, but I hope you won't forget the poor old cook who sailed with you to Skagway. The two laughed and shook hands. Then Erickson stepped into a boat. Good luck, son, he shouted. Be careful. Willie waved and watched from the beach until Erickson's boat reached the Excelsior. Dark smoke rose from the ship and there were black clouds over the white mountains. <laughs>